Thank you, and uh, thank you for this welcome. This is going to be exciting. An event which was almost as exciting as this was happening at the lunch restaurant in 1950 in Los Alamos. At the Los Alamos National Laboratory, the people developing the you know, American nuclear weapons program were, of course, having lunch. And they were discussing, among other things, a cartoon that had recently been in a newspaper as an explanation of why the waste, waste paper bins in New York were disappearing, a cartoonist had suggested maybe it's little green men stealing them and taking them back to their home planet. And the geniuses around the table were chatting about this and that, and could you actually make a flying saucer? And then uh, Edward Teller got into questions about, well, how likely is it with the alien life? And Enrico Fermi, the great physicist, uh, said, where are they? And this has been known, uh, become known as the Fermi question. Sometimes it's called a paradox, because uh, it seems to be a contradiction. But it's really about a very fundamental and interesting tension in our understanding about the universe, and, as I hope I will be able to tell you, why this also matters for us, and what we do here, now on Earth regardless of whether the little green men are existing out there or even stealing our waste, uh, waste baskets. This is a telescope photo looking towards the center of the Milky Way. So through this dust and gas, you can see the bright light of the core of a galaxy. In there, there is a central black hole, an enormous uh, black hole, which we cannot see in this picture. That light is from billions of stars, densely packed. And surrounding many of these stars, there are planets. We know that for certain. We don't know what is on these planets, but we know that there is 100 billion stars in the galaxy, and probably at least that many planets. And if we look outwards, outside our galaxy, we see even more. So this is the Hubble Very Deep Field photo. So the Hubble telescope focuses on a small patch of the sky. And it's about the size of a one square millimeter held at an arm's length. And there are just three stars in this picture. All the rest, all the dots here, are galaxies. Even the small dots that just look like camera noise. Each of these galaxies has 100 billion stars. Now think about how many planets that means. And indeed, there might be even more out there, because we discovered that there are quite a lot of brown dwarfs, stars that don't quite uh, start fusing to produce light, so they just remain there out in the dark. There might be many more of them than the bright stars. And this is also a photo going back very far in time. The oldest galaxies here, they're farthest away. The light started from them and reached us recently 13 billion years ago, not too long after the formation of the universe. This is pretty amazing, because if you think about a planet orbiting one of those stars in one of those small galaxies, at the point in time where that light started leaving it, in reaching us, life might have emerged on the planet. And by now, of course, that star is going to most likely have burned out, unless it was a small red dwarf. They can actually last for trillions of years, so a very kind of uh, energy-saving solution in the universe. The big SUV blue-white supergiant stars just burn out after a million years or so. There's probably some lesson here about energy conservation. But the interesting thing is, if life emerged on that planet, it would have had the time to develop into something as complex as a current biosphere, maybe in intelligence, and now it might be gone. Or it might have become intelligent and left the planet and gone somewhere else. We don't know. And this is true for each and every of those and, and, uh, hundreds of billions of uh, planets in each or every little speck in this picture. This is why the Fermi question is such an interesting tension. We see an enormously big and old universe, a lot of places where life could have emerged, Yet, we don't see any flying saucers in our sky. We don't see a giant signs on the galaxies where the aliens are trying to sell something. We don't get spammed from the universe. At least we haven't noticed it. And the point of spam is, of course, to be noticed. So it's pretty likely that something weird is going on. So this silent sky is an interesting mystery. What's going on here? Well, we've been listening. People immediately started listening for radio transmissions. After all, we're producing a lot of radio transmissions, both accidentally through our radar systems and our television, but also deliberately trying to send uh, signals. People looked at the other planets and found them in the solar system to be apparently lifeless. Mars is a barren desert. 
maybe there was water there once. It's actually very likely we found the traces recently, but we still don't know whether life ever appeared there. So people got more and more interested in what explanation could we come up with? And they have been coming up with lots of explanations. If you can't read the fine print, it doesn't matter. Because each of these possible explanations have other versions and sub-explanations. I have a collection of 150 of them. And one of the most obvious ones is, of course, there are no aliens. Which is interesting, because that would suggest that we are extremely unique. A scary possibility is, of course, that yes, intelligent life does emerge. And then something bad happens to it. And maybe there are aliens out there, but for some reason they're keeping quiet, or we don't notice it. Maybe because we're incompetent, or maybe because it's very hard to transmit signals, or maybe because the aliens know something we don't know. And we better figure that one out in that case. So we've been trying to figure it out. This is a famous equation, the Drake, the Drake equation, attempting to calculate the number of alien uh, civilizations. It's an equation. It's very stupid in many ways, because you multiply together stuff you don't know the values of. But it's an equation. We love equation because it uh, tends to show that we're doing science. <laughs> it's true. Add an equation to your paper and people immediately think it's much more serious than the real. Even if the equation cannot be solved, even if you cannot get good data out of it. So when looking at Wikipedia's entry on the Drake equation to find some numbers, it turned out that when you plug in the numbers different authors and the scientists give, Drake himself, he could plug in numbers to get between two civilizations, us and those little green men somewhere, or 50 million, about the population of Great Britain. And if you take the other numbers that are mentioned on the page, you can get between that we're probably the only civilization in the entire visible universe, over to that, oh, in our galaxy there should be about 100 million of them. It's crowded here. We don't really know the values here. And that is why we get this enormous range. But even the, 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 those uncertainties can tell us interesting things. As we started exploring the universe, we went from this classic picture that, oh, it's just to uh, jump into your nuclear-powered spacecraft. Uh, in the 50s, you had these blonde crew cut space captains, and they jet jetted off to Alpha Centauri. We realized it's a bit harder, actually a lot of harder and expensive. But we did get to the moon. We did get a space shuttle, which was, of course, very expensive and not quite what we wanted. We really want something much better. But we know much more about space flight, and we know we could, in principle, live in space. We have a space uh, station. Yes, it's overly expensive and somewhat crappy. But we know that if we actually cared enough as a species, we could base spa and build space habitat. Technologically speaking, they're not amazingly hard. We just need to be slightly better at getting up into space and financing it. And this already tells us something interesting. Maybe the aliens are not living on planets anymore. They could actually be living in space. Planets might be where intelligence emerges, and then it moves out, because planet surfaces are messy places where meteors hit you, and if a nearby star goes supernova, you can't move away. So maybe we should actually be looking between the stars. We also realized other things. There are a lot of planets. This is from XKCD, uh, and this is already obsolete. Last time I checked, uh, there was, uh, I think, 830 known exoplanets out there, and we're finding more and more. We probably found the two or three already this evening, which I haven't had the chance to check up on. And these planets we're finding out there are very weird. Uh, we're finding giant uh, planets orbiting very close to the stars. We're finding eccentric planets in very wild orbits. We're finding Earth-like planets that most likely have miles and miles of water on them. We're finding planets with metal atmospheres. The possibilities out in the universe are much wilder than we previously thought. Similarly, we find that life is also much more impressive than we thought. Once upon a time, we felt, OK, yes, liquid water like it's on a nice beach, that's about the ideal environment for life. Now we discover that life thrives kilometers down in the Earth's crust among the rocks. We found uh, life forms that find, for example, the saline pond, that red color is bacteria living among the salt, where all the other organisms would just dry out. They're finding this uh, environment lovely. And uh, we can uh, grow bacteria at 400,000 Gs of uh, gravity. They still thrive. They would still thrive on one of those giant planets if it had the right temperature and nutrients. We found that life can survive in the most extreme environments. We also discovered life emerged on Earth quite early, just a few hundred million years after the crust solidified. 
And animals turn out to have a lot more smarts than we previously thought. In a VC gray African parrot, for example, they have demonstrated they can do somewhat logical problem solving and a bit of language. Not quite as good as we are, but still enough to make us realize that the step from animal to human is not terribly large. This is tricky when you start thinking about aliens, because if there are a few steps that are really hard from the emergence of life to intelligence, maybe the reason we're not seeing a lot of aliens must be that intelligence doesn't survive very long. There might be big existential threats out there. So in a sense, it would be very reassuring if it turned out to be very hard to get intelligence. But unfortunately for us, the parrots and monkeys and the whales are actually seem pretty smart. So the weird thing is, the more we learn about the universe, the more life it seems to be possible to have there. It might be that life is located in particular places. Our sun might be in the galactic life zone, an area that is just far, and out, uh, far out from the galactic center, not to be blasted by a lot of supernovas, but sufficiently far in that there have been enough metals. This is astronomer speak. To an astronomer, metal is anything that's not hydrogen or helium. That's a metal. And you need metals to make planets. After all, Earth is made of a sizable degree of oxygen. It's a metal, astronomically speaking. And we need enough of that to form planets. So there might be a band around the galaxy where you could form planets that are not getting blasted. And this has emerged at a certain point in time. The previous ideas about the universe was something enormous and unchanging. Now we realize the universe is evolving. But Earth is actually a fairly young planet. There are many planets in this galaxy, most likely, that are much older, billions of years older. So if any intelligence emerged there, they would be billions of years ahead of us, at least potentially. We also realized another interesting thing. Maybe the best way of going out into space is not to send the space heroes, but actually to send the robots. It's much easier to send a robot to Mars than send a human, who needs a lot of food and water and entertainment during the trip. And going to the stars might equally well, we might need the robots. And maybe the aliens are doing the same. So maybe we shouldn't be looking for alien uh, little green men, but little green robots. And they might go very far, because the universe is very big. And we are discovering that it might be changing across time scales that are simply astounding. The galaxies are not distributed randomly. They're forming uh, giant clusters and the voids and bubbles. And this evolves throughout the history of the universe. As the universe expands, the matter clumps together into the clouds, into galaxies, into galaxy clusters. And then these giant galaxy clusters and clusters of clusters start getting separated by the expansion. Right now, we have a unique situation where we can actually reach other superclusters of galaxies. In a few hundred billion years, this window of opportunity will be over. They're going to be moving away from us too far. We better get started on space rather soon. Actually, I've been calculating that. I've been thinking, well, could we spam the universe? Or could aliens spam the universe? Suppose we actually wanted to go as far as possible. What could we do? So you can start thinking about technologies that don't exist yet by looking at what's allowed by physics. And what we know what we can do. And then there is this big interesting area where we haven't invented it yet, but we can see that if that machine existed, we can calculate that it would work. And then we can start thinking about the consequences. I don't have the time to get into all the details. I'm happy to discuss that later when we show up my papers and our calculations. It turns out that you can do quite a lot. You can, for example, pick apart planets. So let's take Mercury. Close to the sun, put in solar power panels, use that to mine stuff, throw it out into orbit, where we turn it into solar collectors, giving us more power to make more energy, more mining stuff. And so the little Mercury disappears in 40 years. It's four decades. It's quite a long time on a human timescale, but on a cosmic timescale, it's nothing. We can actually pick apart planets. And this is using technology that's not too far ahead of what we actually can do today. In a sense, we already started with our satellites. And we can, of course, once we picked apart Mercury, we can use it to build solar collectors. Imagine that satellite over there. Imagine that surrounding the sun. Trillions of them. What can you use that energy for? Well, quite a lot. Solving the energy crisis is one of the smallest problems. Another use is, of course, to launch probes to other places. Send out robotic probes that can then build other things. This way, you could actually reach an enormous amount of the universe. 
getting to the rest of the Milky Way. No problem. It actually turns out when you calculate this, about the energy that the sun releases in one afternoon is enough to send up probes to all the stars in the galaxy. And why send it to just our galaxy? You could send one probe to every single galaxy that can be reached. Depending on how fast we are, you get a different number. But if you could actually accelerate them up to 99% of light speed, which requires some rather funky equipment, I'm very happy to talk about that too later on, uh, we could reach uh, 5 billion galaxies, each with 100 billion stars. And then, of course, these automated probes could build space habitats and uh, whatever we wanted to have there. And indeed, we can go very far. But aliens could have done the same. And they had an advantage if they started early, because the universe was so much smaller. So the Fermi question seems to be even trickier after my little calculation, because it seems like, well, between a few million and a few billion galaxies could have sent their probes to us. Previous calculations typically were thinking just about the aliens in our galaxy. But we actually need to think about the aliens in all the other galaxies. So the question becomes trickier. You might say, oh, they're all environmentalists, and they all agree on, uh, not to mess up the universe with all the you know, picking apart planets. But then all aliens, regardless of what they were and when they were, would agree on it. I think that's very unlikely. It's very likely that whatever aliens are out there, they're going to think very differently. Or you might put it up as a hypothesis that any sufficiently advanced civilization will come up to certain truths and will converge on it no matter what we started. Even if we're humans or squids or little green men or robots, we must somehow all come up with the same conclusion, uh, which is strange, because we humans are very bad at reaching the same conclusion and getting each other to agree. So, thinking about this, each possible answer to the Fermi question leads to some kind of uncomfortable but interesting uh, possibilities. It might be that all this high-tech I've been talking about is wrong. It might simply be that it's not possible to go to the stars or signal between them. That seems to be counter to what we actually think we can do technologically. So that's a very weird statement. There must be something odd about technology. The second possibility might be that the universe is much more dangerous than it looks. And we should really try to figure that one out before it gets us. And then it might be that everybody agrees on something. And we better figure out what that is. Or it could be that they're here. They already did the expansion and they're keeping the universe pristine. And then we better behave ourselves and figure out how to suck up to them. But perhaps the most interesting thing is we might be alone. That's a frightening thought. But it's also accelerated because that suggests that we're responsible for life and consciousness in the universe. We are actually the species who get the chance to either mess things up badly or actually spread it across the universe. Maybe not spam the universe, but seed it. We are very small and weak as a species. We're on a small planet, but we're a bit like an acorn. It's a small object that can grow into a giant tree. I think we can fill the stars with life. So if it isn't there already, we can bring it. Thank you.